on to the winding drums. And from there, back to the wire drawing machines for further reduction. This is yet another process, fine wire drawing through a wet soap solution. The girl is threading up 11 dyes which work totally submerged in the wet solution. The dyes, after wear, have to come out of the machines and go to the dye grinding shop, where they're examined, opened out and recut to shape, and polished again, ready for use in the wire mill. At the bench, they are re-ground. A girl polishes them to the necessary finish with willow wood, coated at the tip with very fine diamond dust, rouge and other materials. This gives the dye its high mirror finish. This automatic needle grinding machine was designed on the premises specially to grind the needles for opening the dyes. A magnified view shows the dye pierced and polished with a record of the number of times it has gone through the process. It has been in the mill many times at various sizes and has drawn a thousand tons of wire. And so, back to the wet drawing mill, where wire is being drawn to 0 0.0072 of an inch. Before it leaves the mill, the wire must be tested for reliability. First, you see the bend test. Then, a torsion test on a gauged length, 100 times the diameter of the wire, registering the number of twists of which it is capable. In addition, the two ends of all the coils of wire are tested rigidly for tensile, elongation, gauging, wrapping and standard specification of galvanizing in the case of the galvanized wires. All wires not conforming to specifications are rejected for reprocessing. the wire is subjected to similar tests when it arrives to make sure that it's up to the standard essential. In this dipping test, the wire end lies in copper sulphate solution for a given number of minutes according to the size of the wire. The tester examines it to see if the spelter coating is fully protective against corrosion affecting the steel. All ropes must reach a given standard of resistance to tensile, torsion and bend. This girl makes a tensile test to verify the strength of the material. This is followed by a group of ductility tests, including torsion, bending and wrapping, to detect any brittleness set up by maltreatment of the rod in drawing, or any defects in the steel rod itself. The break of the tensile is recorded. The torsion test is usually taken on a length 100 times the diameter of the wire. The number of twists varies according to quality. In the wrapping test, the wire is wrapped on and off itself until it fractures. Thus, the ropery, as well as the wire mill, has satisfied itself about the suitability of the wire for the purpose required, in this case, for an excavator rope. From a store of wire which has been similarly tested in every particular, wire coils reach the winding department. A coil of wire goes on to a swift for winding. The tie bands are cut and the coil slides into position. This is an automatic winding machine. 
The end of the wire is threaded carefully into the machine. The wire is then carried onto the machine bobbin, ready for the stranding process. This is a particularly exacting job, as the bobbin must be evenly wound to suit the stranding machine and prevent slackness and raffles. If tangles or breaks occurred during the stranding operation, there would be a serious hold-up in the work and possibly considerable damage done to the carefully prepared steel wires. Naturally, the bobbin varies in size according to the type of machine which is going to be used. As soon as the bobbin is evenly and completely wound, it goes on a truck to the stranding department, where a variety of machines perform the actual task of spinning the individual strands of the steel rope. Stranding machines are either of the snake type or the sun and planet. Here, for example, is a big snake machine loaded with 19 wires of three different gauges. A wire in the center covered by nine small gauge wires covered again by nine of a larger gauge. A bobbin of wire is loaded into the machine. There are 19 of these. They thread the wire along the periphery of the machine until ultimately all 19 converge through the lay plate to the twisting point at the compression dies. The foreman checks up and the machine gets going. The length of the twist is predetermined according to the type of rope required and is an essential feature of the laying up process. proceeds over the capstan to the takeoff bobbin. The full bobbin of the finished strand is then taken out. There are similar snake machines of varying sizes. Here is another carrying 12 bobbins of wire. In contrast, a sun and planet machine running in triple formation. These 18 bobbins revolve round their center like a planet round the sun. But each bobbin remains in a vertical plane. They carry 18 wires to manufacture a 37 wire strand which they affect by covering a 19 wire strand. This gives a clear picture of the fundamentals of the sun and planet. It also has a headpiece with lay plate on the same principle as the snake machine. Bobbins of strand are loaded in, 
each of them consisting of 19 wires. The closing machine also is of the sun and planet type. Strands similarly are led down. The gear wheels are adjusted while the loading proceeds. The strands have been formed to a predetermined twist and direction. Here the strands are preformed into the helix they will occupy when finally closed. The machine starts up feeding the strands into the compression lines. Finished rope emerges from the other side of the compression lines. The compression rollers are then put on to ensure perfect roundness of rope. Once more, the finished rope goes round the takeoff capstan and then reels onto the big wooden drum. Someone has to be at hand to ensure the even guiding of the rope onto the reel to avoid damage to the rope by crossing. And so the drum of finished rope is complete and ready to be taken away for dispatching. This closing machine has a capacity of 20 odd tons. This rope coming onto the closing reel is four and a half inches in circumference, made up of six strands of 19 wires each of galvanized quality. machine, the rope goes on to have its desired fittings attached by splicing. In this case, the required fitting is a thimble splice. The rope is bent round to seize the thimble in, and it's bound tightly for the splicing operation. The splicer opens out the strands, and he inserts his marlin spike into the rope to open up and thread the strands through. The strands are tucked in and split to put in the last two tucks, thus ensuring that the splice takes a tapering formation. up the splice to take out any slackness. The pincers then trim off the fag ends of the strand. After that, the splicing is parceled to give a good seating for serving. This follows with a soft galvanized strand wound on neatly to protect the splice and give a neat finish. The end of the serving wire is tucked under one of the strands to fix it, and there is the whole job finished. The thimble splice, eye splice, and Bordeaux connection are only three of many possible fittings. Another is a hand-forged conical anchor socket. It's used, among other purposes, for straining guys for aerial ropeways. The socket is threaded onto the rope. The rope is opened out at the end and bent back. This cone is pulled back into the body of the socket. And the socket is adjusted with the cone lying so, ready for metalling. 
After heating and fluxing, the hot white metal is poured into the body of the socket over the cone, and this is the effect that is produced. On the finished rope, a destruction test is carried out. Tremendous strain can be put on it in use, and to make sure that the minimum specified breaking point has been obtained, a length of the rope is subjected to a severe and increasing pull. This rope is tested for breaking at 15 tons. Gradually, the weight behind the pull becomes insupportable. It passes breaking point. The destruction test is completed successfully, for the break was well beyond the estimated point. Every precaution has been taken, every skill used to produce a reliable rope. It is packed, stenciled with the firm's name, and sewn into a canvas cover as a protection. Finally, it is loaded onto a lorry, and off it goes to fulfill the order. And now, the rope in action. It has to be a sturdy and reliable one to operate this dragline excavator working on an open cast coal site. The tug of war with stubborn lumps on the job demands a rope as sturdy as the men who operate it and reliable as the men who made it. A rope. What could be more ordinary and everyday? So commonplace that you hardly notice it. Yet, how many and how great are the tasks it performs? How much depends on it? Especially if it's a wire rope. It drags the bucket through unwilling soil. It raises and lowers the miner's cage. It swings heavy loads on the dockside crane with easy power. The power of many minds and hands transmitted by strands of steel. Thank you.